All right. So our final panel is on the issue of poverty. And certainly, notwithstanding seemingly booming economic times, we've got a huge homeless problem in California, particularly in major cities, San Francisco, Los Angeles, Santa Ana, uh, homeless uh, in, a, in, in Sacramento. Sacramento. <laughs> yes, at, at a level that you know hasn't been seen before. I mean, something's going wrong, and uh, the something may very well be government. Uh, Milton Friedman, by the way, said that if you put the federal government in charge of the Sahara Desert, in five years there'd be a shortage of sand. <laughs> so. I want to introduce uh, our uh, panel on poverty, and our uh, moderator today is uh, PRI's own Kerry Jackson. He is a fellow of our uh, California Center for California Reform. Uh, he also spent 18 years at Investors Business Daily, writing on domestic and foreign affairs issues. And with PRI, uh, Kerry has written about homelessness, Poverty, there is no better moderator for this panel than Kerry Jackson. So please welcome Kerry Jackson. Thank you, Dan. Uh, we, our first speaker is Michelle Steeb. She is Chief Executive Officer at St. John's Program for Real Change right here in Sacramento. She invited me to come by for a visit, so I'm assuming that you're inviting everybody else, too, to come Absolutely. by. Absolutely. Okay. We'd love to have you all. As she describes it, St. John's is a continuum of care that addresses a root cause of homelessness through education, supportive services, and employment training. Prior to St. John's, she was director of the California, I'm sorry, director of public affairs for the California Chamber of Commerce. Michelle? Okay. Thank you. Thank you all for being here, and thanks for having me. Um, as Carrie mentioned, I don't come out of this world. Uh, I was just sharing with my fellow panelists one of my favorite sayings in the world is if you want to God, make God laugh, tell him your plans. And it was not in my plan to run St. John's, but the chamber lent me to St. John's for a month. At that point, it was a 30-day emergency shelter for women and children. And I fell in love with the work and never came back except to tell them I wasn't coming back. So I uh, still have fantastic relationships down here, but I'm really glad that I don't work down here any longer, uh, that I work at St. John's. So I wanted to just start off and share a little bit about what our program is and what it does, because I think that's a really important context for the uh, rest of the panel discussion that we'll be having. Uh, St. John's, just uh, as you heard, we're about 10 minutes from downtown. We're in South Sacramento. We serve uh, about 300 women and children every day who are homeless. A lot of us, when we think of homelessness, we think of the people that we see walking downtown, right? Largely single men and single women. Um, and that's where a lot of the attention is right now. Uh, but women and children actually are one of the most rapidly growing segments of the population. They are often what we call the hidden segment because they're couch surfing or floor surfing. I mean, people will give them a couch or give them a floor because they don't want on their conscious children sleeping outside. But that is one of the most rapidly growing segments of the population. And just to give you a sense, I mentioned we serve about 300 women and children daily. Our daily wait list is between two and 300 women and children long. Every single day, we have a wait list of double uh, the uh, population we're able to serve, or 100% of the population we're able to serve. So what are we? We uh, today are a 12 to 18 month program that helps women and children change their lives. That They're dealing with homelessness, that's one of the issues, but 80%, well, and I'm gonna get to that at the next slide, um, 80, uh, about 80 percent are struggling with uh, uh, drug and alcohol addiction, about 70 uh, percent are struggling with domestic violence, about 60 percent criminal history, about 70 percent uh, mental illness, uh, 50 percent don't have a high school diploma or GED, 
30% have had their children removed by Child Protective Services, by CPS. So they're struggling with a bunch of issues. And what our program really does is in 12 to 18 months help them address all of those issues and many, many more. How to you know, get sober, how to parent sober, how to budget and finance, how to work, how to you know, work with your school to get your children to catch up and, and progress academically, uh, how to actually uh, not only uh, work with managers and, and work with landlords, but how to actually keep uh, your job and how to keep good relationships with your landlords. I mean, the myriad of issues that we uh, work with these women on are uh, sometimes unbelievable. I told the story this morning. Uh, we had a woman come into St. John's about two years ago, Sandy. She had already, it's 25 years old, she had already had five kids removed from her custody permanently. They all went into the system and were adopted out. The sixth child, uh, she was trying to get, regain custody of, and, and she did, and she's out now for two years and doing really well. But the first night at St. John's, uh, she sat down to eat. We eat, you know, at tables all together. Uh, you know, they're not one big table. It's like, you know, 12 or 15 tables. But anyway, Sandy's eating. She's one of eight children. She was the youngest of eight. Her mother and her uh, father split up. Her dad was working two to three jobs to keep uh, the family going, so he was never around. And so anyway, Sandy's eating, and she's chewing with her mouth open. And someone looked at her and said, you can't chew like that. And she said, well, what do you mean? And they told her, you can't chew with your mouth open. You need to chew with your mouth closed, right? So we're dealing with a lot of issues that are you just can't even uh, imagine how rudimentary the issues are, but very, very important to life skills and to success in life. So um, I like to show this slide because even if you were self-aware and you were struggling with homelessness, you were struggling with some of these issues, you wanted some help, this is what it's like to have to go navigate Sacramento to get that kind of help. And none of these services talk to one another. So you know, as uh, you can imagine, a lot of women and children learn how to manipulate the system because they've been living on the streets and that's what they need to do. And so a lot of times they're telling these different people what they want to hear, not necessarily what's going on. And at St. John's, which you'll see here in a second, uh, and by the way, we have a really horrible, um, I'll, I'll call it inadequate, public transportation system. So getting anywhere is like two hours, right? Two hours to get there, two hours to get back. It's very cost costly as well. Uh, so that's what you're looking at, even if you were motivated to change, right? It's just impossible. But at St. John's, we bring all these services under one roof, and they're all coordinated, and people don't fall through the cracks, and their issues don't fall through the cracks. And you'll see uh, our success here in a, in a little bit. We have five, uh, we break our program down again 12 to 18 months, even though it's a 12 to 18 month program, everyone's program looks a little different. We break it down into five levels. Level one being stabilization, which is about 30 days. Again, I'm, I'm giving you time frames here, but it's, it's really individualized. Um, where we're doing a lot of assessment of them, they're doing self-assessment. I mean, what, what got you to this place, right? And we're building basic skills and, and confidence. Uh, levels, level two, months two through four, is employment training. So we operate two restaurants and a daycare program that are hands-on employment training programs for these women uh, that are really, I mean, not, it, it's so much more about building life skills than it really is job skills. We have a 96% placement rate for our women who complete employment training. Even in the bad, even when the economy <laughs> was as uh, challenging as it was, we were able to maintain that rate. Uh, level three is advanced employment training and, and positive uh, network development. So we're very communal. Women uh, and children, they need to be in community. And more importantly, they need a positive support network. And so we're really working with them at this stage to make sure they have that positive support network in place because if they go back to the abuser or the family member that started using with them at 13, which is a story I hear almost every day, and it's just heartbreaking to hear it. If they go back to those folks when they're out and on their own and they need help, like single mothers will, will need, like we all need, they will end up going back 
to the old ways of doing things. So we really are focused on helping them build a, suppo a positive support network. Level four, they get jobs, and I told you about our success rate with that. They start saving money. They've started saving money, actually, along the way, and we're very focused on helping them pay off, not, not doing it for them, but supporting them and paying off debt, because a lot of them have accumulated debt through riding light rail without a ticket or driving without a driver's license or not paying their SMUD bill and it going into collections, right? They've got a lot of debt, so we're working with them to get that paid off uh, before they get to job acquisition. And then level five is, you know, being able to, you know, be on your own, to sustain your family, to sustain yourself. You may need a little bit of public assistance, but, you know, actually most of them don't even qualify for it because they're making, you know, over $14 an hour, which is kind of crazy. But anyway, um, so uh, I'm going to run through because I think I'm taking a little bit longer than I should. We measure success in like a thousand ways, but I'm going to give you some, you know, uh, quick and dirty metrics. One is how many clients, uh, women and children we serve daily. So last year we served about 600. Uh, this year it'll be up around seven or 750 because we uh, added some capacity. And so uh, that number will uh, tick up here pretty soon. The average length of stay is a little over six months. This slide, um, hopefully you can see it, but all of you are welcome to come out and tour. But we don't give people a free pass to the whole program. You have to achieve certain benchmarks at each level. And there's like 600 service hours for each family a month. So there's an incredible amount that goes in. Uh, this is just some of the uh, you know, uh, benchmarks that they need to hit per level. Next slide is enrollment and progression by level. So again, you're not, you don't get a free pass. You need to be invited. You need to hit benchmarks in order to be invited to uh, get to the next level. Um, I just want to give you a, a pretty uh, important stat when you look at this uh, progression. AA, right, has been around for what, 40, 50, I don't know, 60 years. The number of people who stay sober in AA in year one is 10%. The number of people who stay sober the second year, 2%. So if you think about these women and what they've been struggling with, the lives they've been leading, and what they're able to do in this program, it's, it's pretty remarkable. Um, we also measure, oh, did I? Anyway, I'll, I'll get back to it. Uh, we also measure the uh, reduced economic drag. So the average woman comes in with a $528 public monthly subsidy, right? It's CalWORKs welfare. When she leaves, she's making earning $2,500 a month on average. So what that translates to in just one year, you know, if you look at the number of women and children we served in program, we serve some other populations. I'm not going to get into that here. But the average cost to get someone in one year from crisis to self-sustainability is $16,000 and some change. HUD estimates that the county of Sacramento doesn't even track what it costs to have a homeless family in the system because they tell us it's too difficult. Well, the reality is they don't want to track it. And it's other counties do. This county doesn't. HUD says it's between fifty dollars and $100,000 per person to keep someone in the system. We're using the low end of that spectrum, $50,000. The average cost savings is about $34,000 per person at St. John's. And that translates, when you look at the number of women and children we serve, to over $14 million to the taxpayers. Ironically, we lost our funding from the county. We had some funding from the county because we require too much. We are now called by government low, we're, we're called high barrier. Funding, and we'll talk about this on the panel a lot, funding is now only available, public funding, uh, for low barrier programs, meaning you don't require anything of anyone, no sobriety, no accountability. This is not only national policy, it's state policy, and it's our county's policy. Our county chose to adopt this policy as its one size fits all solution. Uh, just quickly, funding. Um, when I started 12 years ago, we were largely reliant on public funding, a small budget, 30-day emergency shelter. Today, we are much more diverse. Uh, we've really reached out to the community to get them engaged. Um, other, you know, some select uh, public funding so sources, but also earned income from our restaurants and our uh, daycare program. 
We, uh, last year, were, uh, about a year and a half ago, were hired by the state of California to run our program for 50 women transitioning from prison. We run it at a separate uh, facility. Um, the women are still in custody. They have anywhere from three to 24 months on their system, but we're running our identical uh, program for this population. And kind of an irony uh, that the state of California, when you look at that population and, and our population of homeless women and children, right? Most of them are struggling with addiction, domestic violence, criminal history, lack of education. So over here in homelessness, we're saying, hey, all we need to do is stick them in a house and don't require them to be sober and don't require them to do anything. But in corrections, they figured out that doesn't work. That's why our prisons became overcrowded. That's why we brought rehabilitation services into the prisons. And by the way, uh, recidivism has dropped about 20 percent, about uh, yeah, 20 percent over the last 15 years. So, just a point to think about. Final, um, in a nutshell, real change is possible. It's not possible for everyone. It is not possible for everyone. But I really believe it's. It, I know uh, it's deep in my soul. I've seen it for 12 years. Real change is possible for this population, and we need to look at different solutions for the different segments of the population. So. Thank you, Michelle. We have next Deacon Jimmy Vargas. He is president and CEO of Father Joe's Villages in San Diego. It is the largest homeless services provider in Southern California. I just found out that about 2,000 are housed every night in the system. Well, I shouldn't maybe even call it a system. Too bad. But uh, Father, Joe, Father Joe's Villages provide those in need with comprehensive housing and supportive services before. Deacon Jimmy was at Father Joe's. He ran human resources for the Copley Press newspaper chain and served in a variety of positions at Citicorp and Citibank. So Father Joe's Villages, uh, good morning. I should say good morning and thank you for, for having me. Thanks for the introduction, Carrie. Father Joe's Villages is entering or will be entering his 70th year actually within another few months. And right now we have a budget of about $34 million. That budget is broken up to about a third public funding, about a third that comes through philanthropy, and the last third comes through corporate and private foundation dollars. All in all, we serve, as Kerry mentioned, uh, more than 2,000, a little over 2,000 each and every single night in various housing interventions, and I'll get into those. Let's see if we can get to the next one. There we go, okay. We have four pillars where we, we break our services up into four pillars. One is the meeting the basic needs of individuals. Housing is a basic need, obviously. Meals are a basic need. And so we have anywhere from emergency shelters, we have transitional shelters, we have interim beds, what are called interim beds. We have all the way up to affordable housing and permanent supportive housing. Obviously, as you go up the spectrum, the more costly it is. And luckily, those who require permanent supportive housing is a small portion of the population, but a very necessary resource, obviously, because otherwise these individuals will fall back in, into homelessness itself. We also operate the day center for uh, City of San Diego, which is uh, just that. It's for homeless men and women single men and women who come in on a daily basis, about 400 cycle in each and every single day, gives us the opportunity to start connecting with them. And also their basic needs, like the fact that they need showers, the fact that they need a place that they, to which they can ma have mail sent to them, as an example, where they charge their phones, laundry services. Some of these basic things that we take for granted um, happen out of the, uh, the day center itself. Employment, as Michelle mentioned, employment is so very, very important. And and we realized that years and years ago. And so our employment center has a, we, well, we go out actually and we survey the market. We see exactly what the employers, for what they're looking for in an employee. And then we um, then come back and develop curricula. So as a result, we have a culinary arts program. We have a security guard card program. We have um, permanent housing manager, um, or property manager program, I should say, as well as hospitality and so forth. Last year, out of these employment services, 92% across the board, 92% of the individuals who went through these programs were able to obtain employment, which is um, absolutely critical. Thank you so much. And 
the children, as Michelle mentioned, you know, it breaks my heart, but the number of women and children who are homeless um, has been growing over the years. And so we have a therapeutic child care center, which is so very critical because these children, when they come to us, and they come to us even from infancy, right? When they come to us, they are typically developmentally delayed, either socially, um, academically as an example, and otherwise. And so it's important that we, we um, intervene there so that they are up to their peer level when it comes to school, school time. Otherwise, what will happen is they, we will be frustrated, they'll fall out of the school system, and they'll repeat the cycle of homelessness. So we have psychologists who work there. We also um, have uh, teachers and social workers, and they work at breaking that cycle of homelessness, bringing them up to, up to their peer level. In fact, through the standardized tests that are used there at that facility, 90% uh, of the children who come to us by the time they are at school level are at peer, at school time, are at peer level, which is uh, phenomenal because some of them come in and they don't even make eye contact, all right, and they have no socialization skills. Um, it's really very, very sad. So um, that's one of our gems, I call it, in our, in our, at our village because it makes such a world of difference when it comes to these children. And then we have a health clinic. Uh, we have a unique, re unique relationship, actually, with UCSD Medical School. It was developed years and years ago. They wanted to develop a dual residency program in psychiatry and in family practice, and they needed a clinical site. Well, thank God they came to us, and we've been their one and only clinical site. In fact, it's one of only six such clinical sites in the United States, and it's been a godsend for our clients because about 45% of those who we serve suffer some, from some type of mental health issues. And so these doctors who are um, trained both in psychiatry as well as family practice are able to really do adequate assessments and diagnosis and are able to diagnose things so that they can then apply the correct intervention to help these individuals get better. And so that's an aspect that we have. We have our, our dental clinic there. We have a substance abuse treatment center. About 25 to 30% of those who we serve suffer from some type of substance abuse issue. Some have both substance abuse and mental um, abuse issues as well. And so uh, they, do, they do marvelous work also. So this year just gives you a sense. Last year we served over 1 million meals, 1,100,000 meals in two dining rooms that we have, breakfast, lunch, and dinner. It's over 3,000 each and every single day. That's a basic, obviously. Uh, we provided housing in some fashion or another. It's 2,000 a night, but over the course of the year, it's almost 4,000 who we see in our housing in, in interventions. On the therapeutic childcare side, I mentioned these children, over 63,000 hours of therapy Therapeutic services have been offered to our children just last year, and 2,500 who came and benefit through came through our health clinic and benefit either through the dental side, the medical side, the substance abuse side, the mental health and behavioral side. Last year, all in all, over 14, almost 15,000 um, unique individuals uh, were served, which was an increase from the prior year of about 1,000. So it shows that the situation in San Diego is getting worse. It has, we have down in San Diego the fourth largest homeless population in the United States. So let me just tell you about one very effective program. I want to just focus on this in my, in my closing remarks. And uh, it was called Project 25. A number of years ago, it was 2011, the uh, city, the county came to us because of our expertise, and they wanted us to focus on the heaviest users of the system. By that is, are those who use the ambulances, ambulance service, uh, hospital stays, um, nine calls to 911, uh, wind up in the jail system, right? All those various services that are very costly to a community. And so they came to us, they wanted us to, to find those 25 heavy users in the community, which wasn't anything that was very hard to do by the way, because we knew them, the hospital systems knew them, um, the ambulance service knew them, so it was, hard, it was easy to target 25. In, in fact, so much so that at the end of the day, the city kept on asking us to add people, and we wound up with 36 individuals in this particular pro pilot program, which was fine. We kept the name Project 25, but the, but the purpose here was to really apply the resources necessary against this population in order to keep them from using these other services so that longer term, it would be less costly for the community. No one knew how effective this was going to be. So if you go 
three, if three years into this program, we, it was proven, by the way, the Point Loma University, Nazarene University came in and did an independent study and proved that throughout that three-year period of time, we, we had saved the community a net of almost $4 million, okay? And that was in decreased hospital uh, stays, in, in decreased emergency room visits, as you see here, and in, in, in a lowering of arrests all by over 60% as it relates to this population. Now, what it took was a concerted effort amongst really a specialized team that we put together in order to make this happen. But despite the fact that it took that effort and it was a costly program, the net effect was still a reduction in what the community was paying out across the board as it relates to this. Very quickly on this one here, I'll, I'll further emphasize how important it is for nonprofits to be doing this work and not for government agencies to be dictating it. When we got the funding for this, by the way, and it was primarily from the United Way and the City Housing Commission offered vouchers that were necessary so that we could place these individuals directly into housing but then be with them many hours each and every single day to make sure they would remain within those four walls because they needed uh, heavy intervention. They gave us, when we were given those dollars, there were no purse strings. It was do what you do best, all right, and see how this works out. The county hired another firm, and, and in so doing, they gave them a certain amount of money, and they highly regulated how they were to dispense those services. So time and time again, we, our crew kept on being called in to service and provide support for those individuals who were supposed to be supported by the county. Why? Because the county was count, count, expected the provider to count widgets. I'll call them widgets. And that meant that an individual was to be seen X number of times a week, whether he or she needed that level of intervention or not. And so what, what occurred was when that person was seen in that week, once or twice, whatever it was, that the, the provider could not go back to that person even if that person needed the intervention. And again, this is a severely impacted population. So without that, really the adequate support, what happens? You fall out of the program. So it just shows you a perfect example of how we, heaven knows we need government dollars because they, we need government dollars. I mean, there, there's a lot of work to be done. As Michelle mentioned, she has a waiting list of two to 300. We similarly have a waiting list of over 200 each and every single night. And I, and I know it would be much more than that, except that people don't even bother putting their names down when they realize that there are 200 people ahead of them. Ahead of them. And, so, and so it just shows that while these government dollars are necessary, Leave it to the experts to really get the job done. Don't, have, don't regulate it so much because, obviously, because then it just hampers us in the work that we're trying to do and the effectiveness struggles uh, as a result of it. So supportive housing, uh, and this was a, a, a sign of supportive, ho supportive housing. It gives you a sense here of what, what it entails. At the end of the day, what it entails is really um, a, a customized, and it has to be customized, not a one-size-fits-all, but a customized plan for each individual who is severely impacted in various ways in order for them to be successful. The average tenure, as you see here, the average tenure of tenants living in our supportive housing is nearly six years. Only 9% exited unsuccessfully, which is a great, uh, which is a great success statistic. That comes through a lot of effort, right? A lot of compassion, obviously. Um, but it is proven to be effective. Elaine, I'll just very quickly tell you about Elaine. There are many Elaines, but Elaine is someone who has benefited from our burn, uh, permanent supportive housing. She came to us quite broken, actually. She had been in abusive situations time and time again. She was someone who talked about an individual who didn't make eye contact, right? Um, we find that in kids a lot, but, but with, uh, with Elaine and she is, she's delightful, Elaine's delightful. She's, we've helped her to get up on her feet. I mean, she's done it herself, right? But with the, the correct support, she's uh, benefiting from our permanent supportive housing and is, is really, now has, has a job, right? Feels good about what she's doing, the contribution that she's making, and the fact that she's able to take care of herself. Lastly, what I'll, I'll show you is um, what we call the turn in the key. I arrived on, on the scene, by the way, to Father Joe's Villages four years ago. Within a year's time, I said, you know, we have to do something that's very, very different than that's been 
different than what has been done to date in San Diego. And I met with our board over the course of one Saturday. And at the end of it all, we put a strategic plan in place, but at the end of it all, we, we said, you know what, let's do something that truly would be commensurate with the problem that's out there. And it's a huge problem. So let's put together a, a, an audacious plan. Part of that plan was to build out 2,000 affordable housing units throughout a five-year period of time. All right? Because while we're able to take care of the immediate issues of individuals, and we've been doing that for years, taking people off the streets. The reality is that one of the problems we have in San Diego, and it's shared by a number of coastal cities here in, in California, is that we don't have enough affordable housing. Right? In San Diego, the average one bedroom um, rental is at $1,800. And by the way, it's, we only have a rental vacancy rate of about three to three and a half percent. We're tied with LA for having the lowest rent rental vacancy in the entire United States, right? Which means it's a toxic combination. It means no, no sooner does an apartment come on the market, first of all, it's expensive, and it gets scooped up pretty quickly, right? So obviously, that, that's to the detriment, especially of our population. And so we said, let's provide, let's continue to provide the immediate recourse, obviously, in taking people off the streets and the services that are necessary, but let's also build out so that uh, it, while it's costly, let's build out so that we have a dwelling and an end place for these individuals. Otherwise, they will wind up on the street again. They can't take stay in temporary measures uh, forever. So this is the building actually uh, that was approved unanimously, uh, the design of it by our Civic San Diego Board. Uh, it's rare that they, they vote anything unanimously, and, and they did on this building. So it's beautiful. This is an actual rendering. We are, God willing, going to break ground in this, on this building in three months. Okay, so we're almost there. We've been working on, on it for two years. It's, it's a 14-story building, 407 units. It's, it's the largest of its kind in San Diego. All right, targeting our populations specifically, it will take uh, off the streets about 550 individuals, men, women, children, veterans, seniors, those who are disabled. Of the 407 units, 270 of them will be permanent supportive housing units. All right? A costly prop proposition, and yet what's more costly, as Michelle, Michelle alluded to this, is keeping these individuals on the street. That's extremely costly to a community, economically and otherwise. And so this is just one example. As part of the turning the key, by the way, it's not just new construction. I will also be closing, again, God willing, we'll be closing on a, on a motel, we're an Escarano motel in the South Bay area, um, 83 units, and needed you know, needed a pick-me-up, I'll call it. And we were able to acquire it according to, in, in, within our financial model. And I'll tell you about that just very quickly. But um, so that at the middle of the year, we'll, we hope to be uh, close escrow, start refurbishments, and have it online by the end of the year. That'll be 83 units. So these motels, the motel part of the turning the key, um, you have units up and ready in shorter order, obviously, than with new construction. But the net effect is the same. You're taking people um, um, off the streets. The financial model to which I mentioned, by the way, and there will be my last piece, is has to do with uh, the fact that these have to be self-sustaining. That was a requirement before we would go into it. I wasn't going to go into it and have to raise philanthropic dollars for it. And so uh, the, it will be uh, self-sustaining in that the rents that are garnered from this will pay for the operations of the building as well as the services that will be provided in the building itself. So I'll leave you with that. Like Michelle, I extend an invitation to you to come and visit us and see us in action. It's one thing to hear me talk about it, and this was very quick, um, but it's another thing to see it in action. We're not as close as Michelle, though. We're down in San Diego, but it's beautiful down there. Yeah. God bless you. Take care. I live in San Diego. Thank you, Deacon Jimmy, and I'll be quick to get to Damon Dunn, our next speaker. He's the fellow in business and economics at the Pacific Research Institute. Also a successful real estate developer, investor, and businessman. He's played college football at Stanford and played pro football in the NFL and has also been a Hoover Institution fellow. Damon. I'm going to keep it short because we're running over time. So I'll just say this. Um, my mom had me at 16. My father was killed when I was three. Um, I lived with my grandparents, and we lived in a trailer. Uh, there were 10 of us. I had many sandwiches probably three, four days a week. I was on every government program for reduced lunch, welfare, et cetera. 
I lost three friends to murder by the time I was 15. Two of the uncles that I slept with in the same bed went to prison, one for murder, one for armed robbery, and now uh, I'm the success story, having gone to Stanford University, having uh, had an opportunity to play in the NFL, having had a chance to make uh, millions of dollars throughout uh, my professional career, have a midlife retirement for seven years, and now uh, being a managing partner of a private equity fund for a really wealthy family office. So that's the beginning, and that's the end of that story. I didn't really want to spend time on that. You saw a word up there, and I'm changing kind of my presentation based on Michelle and, and what Deacon Jim presented, mental health. So I'm the guy that lived in this environment. I'm the Elaine in that story, the people who need the services that they're providing. And typically we talk about me as the success story and then what are all the services you need to be able to get there. I wanna talk about what keeps a person from even being ready to accept those services. And uh, Michelle talked about everyone is not gonna be helped. There's always a population of people that have significant mental health issues. And I wanna just delve into one area of mental health issues. And I do believe that nonprofits can address this, particularly if we have better relationships between our K-5 uh, elementary schools and some of the nonprofits that we have. K-5 teachers can identify students that are truant, that have family issues, that has a brother or a sister that's in a gang. If we can intervene and get our nonprofits in to be able to work with some of these students, at least from my experience, I think that we could see a lot of success. So let me, as a person who's coming from this community, first outline for you and bring you into my community uh, so you can feel as I get ready to talk about um, some of these issues that people face from a mental health perspective. So let me open up the world that I came from, where I live. There's a rap song by uh, Grandmaster Flash called The Message that really uh, capsulizes everything that I want to share. A child is born with no state of mind, blind to the ways of mankind. God is smiling on you, but he's frowning too, because only God knows what you'll go through. Sorry, I clicked it and it went out. Um, You'll grow up in the ghetto, leaving second rate, and your eyes will sing a song of deep hate. The places you play and where you stay looks like one great big alleyway. You'll admire all the numbers, book takers, thugs, pimps, and push and pushers, and big money makers, driving big cars, spending 20s and 10s, and you'll want to grow up and be just like them. Smugglers, gramblers, uh, burglars, gamblers, pickpocket peddlers, and even panhandlers. You say, I'm cool, I'm no fool, but then you end up dropping out of high school. Now you're unemployed, all non void, walking around like pretty boy Floyd. Turned stick up kid, but look what you done did. Got sent up for an eight year bid. Now your manhood is took, and you're a Maytag. Spend the next two years as the undercover. Been used and abused to serve like hell till one day you were found hung in a cell. It was plain to see that your life was lost. You was cold and your body swung back and forth. But now your eyes sing that sad, sad song of how you lived so fast and died so young. A lot of our young people that live in the communities where I came from are singing, don't push me because I'm close to the edge. I'm trying not to lose my head. It's like a jungle. Sometimes you make me wonder how I keep from going under. And what you find is that the way that people in our communities think on a subconscious level has undermined the expectations of what they think they can achieve. When you look back at how I got out and the friends of mine in my community who had the same issues that I faced. I didn't have a father. My mom had me. She was a 15-year-old freshman in high school getting pregnant. Uh, we were poor. We had all the same violence, all the same environmental situations. But what was the difference? The difference ultimately was expectations. They, and it wasn't that they had no expectations, is that they had low expectations and they met them. And I consider this a mental health issue because people came into my life and started to bring up my expectations. And what I would be what Norman Vincent Peale would, uh, would say is a possibilitarian, being able to learn to see beyond what was probable. What are the probable outcomes based on the statistics of me growing up in this environment? What are the probable outcomes? Can you see beyond what's probable, what's plausible, and see what is possible? Um, there's some fascinating research done uh, in behavioral economics and in psychology. A man by the name of Daniel Kahneman wrote a book called Think Fast, Think Slow. And he says that the brain uses two systems pretty much to operate. System one is fast, intuitive, quick. It's a part of the brain that's engaged when someone says, or you hear a male voice say, I'm pregnant. Right, that doesn't make any sense. Immediately, your brain recognizes something about biology, about voice tonality. That's the quick intuitive part, system one. System two is the slower, more deliberate, more conscious part of the brain that's engaged when someone says, what's 14 times 27? Or give me the alphabet backwards from Z to A. And what he discovered is that most of us spend our lives thinking using system one making all our decisions. And system one is primarily operating on what's called associative memory. So there's all these ideas that are dropped in your head because you grow up in the environments where you are. You see your cousins, your friends, your brothers, you see what's on television, your, you know, your neighbors. Everything is dropped into your head. And then you start to have someone says, what's two plus two? You say four. You didn't calculate it. You just associated it with those things. That's your associative memory. Now, the fallacy in your associative memory is that it 
cannot use information. It ignores information it doesn't have. It also can create cause and effect situations that are not accurate, that are not true. So here's a good example as I'm speeding through this. Uh, you grow up in my neighborhood, uh, poor people, you don't see a lot of people going to Stanford or to Harvard or being CEOs or making millions of dollars. And so you start to get this thing that's sitting in your head that poor people can't succeed, poor people work at the local factory, poor people you know, do low income jobs, minimum wage, and you just end up doing those same things. And then guess what, one day you try your very best at some school project or in some job and you fail, you're likely to conclude that that's just par for the course for poor people. That's the way it's supposed to be. Well, in reality, it was just a setback. It was a learning opportunity. But because your system one, your associative memory has been seeded with, if you're poor, you can't succeed, you just lower your expectations and, and it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy over and over. I just gave you a very complicated riddle about what happens in my community with people that I grew up with, my uncles, my family, my friends, and why they didn't make it out and what they thought they could achieve and why their expectations stayed low. And a lot of this stuff has to deal with mental health issues. And so what I really wanted to do today is kind of give you a small little breakdown into that. And I'll finish with this. I, when I have a program called the Long Beach College Prep Academy down in Long Beach, and we uh, work with hundreds of students to access, give them access to be able to go to college. And now Chris Steinheiser, who's a superintendent there, I funded it the first couple of years. Now um, um, he's put it into the school budget on a five-year budget. So, And we've expanded it to all six of their high schools now, so the comprehensive high schools that Long Beach has. Won't go into detail about that. But this is what I share with my kids every time that I'm with them. I tell them all, I want you to die broke. And they're like, what does that mean? And I said, it's not, it has nothing to do with money. It has everything to do with what's on the inside of you. The wealthiest place in the world is a grave because people die with books that were never written, companies that were never started, services that never got provided, compassion that was never extended, relationships that you never pursued. Because at some point you got to the starting line and based upon the mental health issues, the lowering of your expectations, based on the associative memory and the things that you're dropping into your profile and your psyche every single day, you decide I'm not pretty enough, I'm not smart enough, uh, I'm brown, I'm gay, I'm Muslim, I'm Jewish. Uh, it, you come up with all these different reasons why you can't achieve and then in life it holds you back and you die with all those things inside of you. So my encouragement to my young people and to everyone here today, die broke, invest everything that's inside you. Some will work, some won't work, but find a way to be able to break through so that you can have the opportunity to live with higher expectations and achieve some of the things that they've gone through uh, in the stats that we talked about. Thank you guys. Thank you, David. How are we on time? We have about five minutes for questions. Thank you. First of all, I've, sort of two. Damon, if you haven't done a TED Talk, <laughs> please do. Please do. I have. Just YouTube it. I've done it. Have you? Okay. Good. Okay, okay, good. On this topic, by the way. Oh, great. Okay. okay. Uh, this is for Michelle and Jim. Uh, your, the outcomes that you're – obviously, you have really terrific pro, uh, management processes and tracking processes, and your outcomes are really impressive. In the corporate world, it's, this is the backbone of a franchise. Have you talked about that? Have you thought about franchising what you guys are doing? Because, and, and are they, are they, is it rep, rep, replicable? Um, well, I, I will just say I uh, breezed through the last parts of my slides just because I uh, wanted to adhere to time uh, re restraints. But on the last slide, I uh, mentioned that this is a replicable model. We've set it up uh, as such, and we're working with uh, at the federal government level to try and get this uh, replicated. It is uh, the federal government policy is actually what drives this. You know, Damon, um, I'm so glad you said what you said. They call it low barrier. We call it low expectation. And it's the federal government under HUD that really started this. And um, and so it's we have some policy change to make in order to get something like this funded. Uh, and we're working really hard to do that. But yes, uh, it can be replicated. It should be replicated. But I just want to also stress there isn't, you know, St. John's doesn't work for everyone. Uh, your program doesn't work for everyone, right? It, there needs to be multiple pathways out of homelessness, out of poverty, just as there are multiple pathways in. What, what I would add to that, and actually, especially with the turning the key, we made it so that other communities could replicate it. And uh, the North, there's an agency up in North County in San Diego 
that has called, and I've had conversations, and actually they're rolling out a variation of it, not building new construction, but as it relates to the motel aspect of it. So that most definitely is picking up. Over the years, in general, as far as our services are concerned, we've been visited by many communities from various places, um, from Hawaii, from Alaska, from various places. Sacramento, the assistant city manager, uh, just came in and visited with us just um, a few months ago, actually, as well. And so um, it, it, variations of our models have been picked up in other communities uh, throughout the years.